It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Larry Lasseur of the CBS television news staff, and Thomas Hamilton, chief United Nations reporter for the New York Times. Our distinguished guest for this evening is Dr. Walter C. Laudermilk, noted soil conservationist and author of the Jordan River Development Plan. And Dr. Laudermilk, you've just spent two and a half years in Israel, I understand, as a chief consultant in soil conservation and land reclamation. Could you tell us exactly what was the nature of your work out there? Well, we were trying to put the Bible lands on the contour, to cultivate the lands on the and contour, because uh, uh, this part of the world has suffered a great deal of damage from soil erosion through the ages. And uh, now this great influx of immigrants into the country calls for building up the productive capacity of these old lands. Uh, actually, my work was the carrying out of the third part of our scheme of the Jordan Valley Authority that the announcer just mentioned. Well, may I ask her, what is the greatest need of the Holy Land at this time? Well, I would say that one of the greatest needs is the, uh, besides peace, of course, is the uh, full use of the land uh, uh, with conservation of the soils and the rains that fall on them. And to bring this about, we need uh, trained technicians who drive the stakes, indicating where these measures are to be put in, designing them and driving the stakes for them and supervising the, the construction of such measures. Well, the United States, Doctor, has just drawn up its own plan for the development of the Jordan River. Yes. And Mr. Eric Johnston just went out a few weeks ago yes. to Israel and the Arab states. Yes. Could you tell us what you think about it? Well, I haven't uh, really, I haven't seen this uh, plan. Uh, as it has uh, the verbatim report of it because we were pretty busy in Israel and those things yeah. didn't come to us. Uh, but as I gather from the reports of it that it has in some of its features are similar to our original plan but I wasn't aware that the uh, the uh, plan in use, uh, pla is, is de uh, develops the full capacity of the uh, of the water resources or of the power resources of the area. Dr. Adamil, could only if you could give us an outline of your original plan for the Jordan River development. Well, uh, when I was out there for the Department of Agriculture to see what we could learn from the use of old lands through the centuries that might be of benefit to our farmers and stockmen here in the United States, I ran on to this situation which uh, seemed to me to uh, offer a possibility of developing that part of the world to much greater uh, capacity to sort support people. Uh, the idea was very simple uh, that uh, the waters, the fresh waters, sweet waters of the Jordan and its tributaries be diverted for irrigation. These waters now, as you know, flow into the Dead Sea and are lost entirely by evaporation. And when such waters uh, would be fully used, then the flow into the Dead Sea would be uh, very low. As a consequence, the Dead Sea would begin to fall in level. And that would make possible then the second part of the plan of uh, introducing Mediterranean seawater through separate canal system, of course, so that the salt water would not mix with, uh, get mixed up with the fresh water or, uh, or, or damage the land. This separate canal system then would drop the seawater uh, through a fall of 1,300 feet to the level of the Dead Sea uh, through turbine, uh, turbines, of course, hydroelectric power plants to produce a considerable amount of power. These were the two uh, features of the scheme that seemed to me very uh, possible on the basis of my examination of the country. And so I recommended that it be engineered and it was by James B. Hayes and 
joined by a consulting board consisting of uh, John L. Savage, our, one of our greatest engineers who built the Boulder Dam and the Grand Coulee Dam, and the chief engineer of the TC, uh, T Tennessee Valley Authority, and uh, others. Now, um, actually, the engineers were more optimistic in their findings than I was in my original estimates. This, this is called the TVA on the Jordan and is published as a book which you may know. Well, Dr. Lattimore, do you think it would be possible to put back the Holy Land and the surrounding area uh, to the state of abundance in which it was in biblical days? Well, I think in many ways it would be possible. <coughs> in some ways it cannot be because the soils have been washed off the hills, uh, in many cases to bedrock. These soils have been spread out on the floodplains and out on the coastal plain, uh, covering up land that, uh, good land of former times. Uh, the soil is deeper than necessary. In other words, th there has been a movement of the soil from one place to another. But there is much good soil in these lower areas. Now, uh, in that way, the productive capacity has been damaged uh, and reduced. But other possibilities, such as the bringing in water for irrigation, which was not done in ancient times, and the development of power potentials of the area, would enable us to uh, develop there, I think, a productive capacity that would probably exceed that of ancient times. You mean that modern technology has given you other tools that might make the parts of the Holy Land even more productive than they were I in think the so. days of the Bible? Yes. yes, and of course there are technolo technological institutes. There's only one really technological, technological institute in that country, uh, in Haifa, which is uh, what they call the Technion of Haifa, is one of the um, uh, foremost uh, institutions of that, car of that kind, training young men which are needed for uh, doing this technical work. Uh, in the development and making full use of the resources of the area. Well, Dr. Lattimore, how many people do you think that the Holy Land could uh, really support if your plans for its development were carried out? Well, I made an estimate um, on the basis of uh, uh, the Jordan Valley scheme, which, if you recall from my little book on Palestine Land of Promise, included the original mandate area to the uh, Jewish National Home, which included what is now known as Trench Jordan, as well as Palestine. And I estimated that on the basis of full use and development of the area, that the, the total population w might reach as much as six million people in those two areas. I've read your book, <coughs> Doctor, and I've also read the plan that the United States and Mr. Johnson have been yeah. presenting, and I think that the there's only one important difference that I've been able to spot, and that is that under your plan, I believe the water uh, taken from the Jordan would be used mainly for the coastal plain of Israel and the, as far as it would go at least, to the Negev, whereas under the plan that Mr. Johnson has been uh, explaining to the government, uh, most of the water would be used for the Jordan Valley itself. I was wondering, what, could, what would you recommend now Mr. Johnson has taken this plan around. He's presented it to the United Nations, too. Can you see any, any way to, uh, to, uh, to reconcile any differences between your plan, and, uh, as uh, elaborated, and the, and the American the United States plan? How would you go about it? Well, we would uh, go about it this way. We would take an inventory of the land. See, not, all, all, not all land is suitable for irrigation. And topography, it may be too steep or cut up with its gullies and canyons and so on. Uh, we have just finished an inventory of the lands of Israel, by the way, which now uh, Israel is able to say, and this was done by the assistance of the FAO of the United Nations in supplying field uh, experts in uh, various phases of uh, study of lands, uh, this would be one of our first steps uh, to find out uh, by field examination of the soils uh, what, uh, what areas would be suitable for irrigation. 
Now we may, uh, we suspect from all the examinations that we made that the, um, that the, uh, there is not enough land in the Jordan Valley itself to use all the water of the Jordan and the Yarmouk. If you'll notice from our studies, or Mr. Hayes' study, that the uh, lands on the east of the Jordan, which are the best lands in the Jordan Valley, by the way, and most extensive, would, prob would, would uh, need and use the waters of the Yarmouk. Whereas the lands on the west of the Jordan, below the Basin Plain, are unsuited, are very poorly suited for any irrigation. Was the final question, Dr. Laudermilk, I'd like to ask you, uh, doesn't, does your plan demand the collaboration of other countries, or what do you think the function of the United Nations is in the Middle East? Well, it, uh, it calls for collaboration. Without collaboration uh, in the development of these resources, I don't think we're going to get very far. That's why I think the United Nations must take the lead in bringing about collaboration. Collaboration rather than conflict is the solution. Uh, to uh, permit con conflict to arise in such an area it would be, I think, a great misfortune because the rights of water rights of both sides should be fully protected. And those uh, can be protected by a full examination of uh, the potentialities of the past uses of water and of the uh, uh, rights <coughs> that have been established uh, so that uh, the United Nations, it seems to me, is the key, has the key to this situation. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Lattimuck. It's been very interesting to have you here tonight. The opinions you've heard our speakers express tonight have been entirely their own. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Larry Lesser and Thomas Hamilton. Our distinguished guest was Dr. Walter C. Lattimuck, noted soil conservationist and author of the Jordan River Development Plan. As the child of today can't imagine a world without television, so we all wonder how the Pilgrim Fathers ran their affairs without a single timepiece worthy of the name. The pendulum clock had not then been invented, and in 1621, the first accurate timepiece was still a century away. As a matter of fact, the history of the Longines watch is virtually the history of modern watchmaking, and we at Longines give thanks daily that the founding fathers of our company elected to make watches of the highest character exclusively, and that successive generations have rigidly adhered to this single ideal. The Longines Christmas watches now on display at your authorized jeweler are superb examples of the traditionally high standards of Longines workmanship, and each is worthy of the 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and the high honors for accuracy which Longines watches have won over the years. So for the most important name on your Christmas gift list, no other name on a watch will mean so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch. And remember that you may buy and proudly give a Longines watch this Christmas for as little as $71.50. Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored Christmas gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company. Since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longine Whitnor Watches. See the th this is the CBS Television Network.